Hello, everybody. We're ready to go. I can start off with a little story. My wife and I were heading out to the car to drive in today, and I locked the keys in the house, locked ourselves out of the out of the out of the house, but um, we we survived that little challenge, thankfully. So, <laughs> so it's wonderful to see everybody. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. Um, so, on behalf of the associates of the Boston Public Library, I'm delighted uh, to welcome you to one of our favorite events, the Hundred Year Retroactive Book Award. My name is Peter Brown, and I'm honored to serve as the chair of the associates. As most of you know, we're an independent nonprofit dedicated to the preservation and promotion of the many treasures that live in the special collections of the BPL. We're so pleased to be together tonight for our celebration of books, the written word, and their enduring impact on our society. We have a, a wonderful crowd uh, with us in person uh, this evening, and we also have a wonderful uh, crowd attending over Zoom. So we welcome you all and thank you so much for being with us. So tonight we're gonna to turn the clock back a hundred years and we're gonna examine where we were as a society and debate how far or more likely how little we've progressed over the last hundred years. Um, we started the hundred year retroactive book award uh, over 20 years ago and we found it to be a, a fun quirky way to explore the past and take measure of how we're doing today. I hope that you will enjoy the, the lively discussion and exercise your right to vote for the best book of 1922. So because of the pandemic, uh, we missed a year. We, we could not host the book award last year, but we didn't wanna lose um, an opportunity to celebrate uh, the best books of 1921. So we decided to vote on the best book virtually and uh, we have a winner. Uh, and the winning book from 1921 will be announced uh, tonight before we start 1922. So before I introduce our moderator, um, I wanna take a moment uh, to thank everyone who's made uh, the event this evening possible. So I'm delighted to say that this year's uh, book award was generally, uh, generously sponsored by an anonymous donor. And that donation made this hybrid event possible. So from the bottom of our collective hearts, uh, we thank our anonymous donor. Um, I'd also like to thank the co-chairs of the committee uh, that organized this event, uh, Tim Carey, who's with us tonight, and Lisa Fagan Davis, who's also with us tonight. Thanks so much for your dedicated leadership and your gift of time and energy and your love for this event. Yeah. So Tim and Lisa also serve on our board. I um, also want to give a shout out to our vice chair, um, Bill Martin, who's with us tonight, and thank him for his leadership over the past couple of decades. Right, Bill? Thank you, Bill. And finally, I want to express our appreciation for our wonderful library president, uh, David Leonard, and the fabulous, talented staff at the library for their continued partnership with the associates. Without them, without their support and collaboration, programming like this would not be possible. So before we start, a few housekeeping details. You're all used to these. Um, there's, no, there's no intermission. I know that's very sad for most of you, but there's no intermission. Um, please turn off your cell phone. To ensure everyone's safety, please keep your mask on at all times. Uh, we cannot allow any eating or drinking indoors. Sorry about that. Photography and videography during the show are prohibited. The bathrooms are up the stairs and in the back straight on the same level. And finally, in the case of emergency, please exit the way you came in via the doors in the back of the auditorium. So now it's my honor uh, to introduce Kennedy Elsie, our moderator for this evening. As Hi. you know, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, well, I got to say a few wonderful Are you words say the about words? you. Oh, first. Go right ahead. Yeah, so <laughs> as uh, you all know, she's co host of the popular morning radio program, uh, Carson and Kennedy, on Mix 104.1, where they make us laugh and cry all together. Thank you for that. Um, and as well as being an ardent supporter of the associates, uh, Kennedy is, is a wonderful, generous, giving person. Uh, she's involved in, in many important community organizations and programs, including Carson and Kennedy's Cool Kids and Your Light is Needed, which is an important fundraiser for the Samaritans. 
Uh, Kennedy also serves on the board of the Samaritans, helping to raise awareness of important mental health issues. So we are honored to have Kennedy with us tonight. The floor is yours, thank, thank you. you. Hi everyone, again, my name is Kennedy and I just uh, wanna thank the associates of the Boston Public Library for allowing me to be a part of this tonight. I've been pestering them for years to let me play. <laughs> and so today I'm just so thankful to, uh, to allow me to be a part of it. I'm certainly not the academic, but I will try and keep things moving and keep you smiling. So we get two years for the price of one tonight. Um, so we'll just briefly take you back to 1921. The US and Germany signed the Treaty of Berlin. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier was dedicated. Einstein won the Nobel Prize. And we had some famous births to include Britain's Prince Philip, John Glenn, Nancy Reagan, Lana Turner, and Rodney Dangerfield, who got no respect for the rest of his life. Uh, the first radio, uh, the first baseball game was broadcast on radio that year. It was not the Red Sox, because they did not win. Um, <laughs> Behave Yourself won the Kentucky Derby and topping the charts. Second hand rose by Fanny Bryce, and the man followed by paparazzi was Fatty Arbuckle. So just to bring up to speed of where we were then, I would like to now introduce you to Allison Schott, who will talk about the three 1921 books that were in the running for the virtual vote and announced the 1921 winner. Allison is an IRNE and Elliot Norton award-winning theater artist who works at the intersection of directing, design, and physical storytelling. She is the associate artistic director and founding partner of Cambridge-based theater company Moonbox Productions, where their recent credits included 2021's The Rocky Horror Show and 2019's Norton Award winner for Outstanding Musical Parade. When she's not working on stage, like productions of Moonbox's Carolina Change, Allison is a voice actor, a movement coach, and an academic administrator at Harvard University. What did you do today? I would like to welcome you, Allison. <laughs> Thank you all so much. It's such a rare treat to see an audience. This is my second time in two years. Um, I used to do this a lot. Uh, hopefully I haven't lost the touch. I felt a little uncomfortable giving an award not at a podium, even if that award is to a book that has been written and an author who has been dead. Uh, so here I am at the podium to present first the nominees for the 100 year retroactive book award. The public already voted online for the best book of 1921. Their choices were Yevgeny Zamyatin's We, Ludwig Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, and Luigi Pirandello's Six Characters in Search of an Author. For those unfamiliar with the books, We is an influential dystopian novel that takes place in the one state, a civilization ruled by an author authoritarian government. The novel marks the emergence of the dystopian genre and influenced George Orwell and Aldous Huxley. Tractatus Logico Philosophicus is a significant philosophical work of the 20th century. Wittgenstein wrote notes for the book during his time as a soldier in World War I, completing the book during his military leave in 1918. The goal of the book is to identify the role of language in providing a picture of reality. And finally, Six Characters in Search of an Author premiered in 1921 at the Teatro Valle in Rome. The play, using the device of theater within a theater, tells the story of six characters who come to a theater and demand that the manager and actors stage their life stories. Six characters is an exploration of illusion and reality that greatly impacted later playwrights such as Samuel Beckett, Eugene Ionesco, and Jean Paul Sartre. And the winner of the 100 year retroactive book award is Six Characters in Search of an Author. <laughs> So I'm delighted to say that I was asked to share a few more words about this play, which is one that I really love. So I hope you'll take a brief ride with me. Uh, I can only speak from my own perspective, but to my mind, the enduring popularity and influence of six characters lies not just in its groundbreaking innovations, but also because of its complexity and its emotional impact. Six Characters empowers audiences to join the playwright, cast, and production team in creating, maybe even dismantling, a shared reality. And it trusts and invites them to define their own experiences of the play. 
in six characters, we find not arid philosophizing or navel gazing, but something violent, raw, purple and yellow as a bruise. The play blends whimsy, humor, philosophy, terror, violence and darkness without apology. And its influence can be felt in countless of its contemporaries. I think notably of Bertolt Brecht, as well as the previously mentioned Beckett, UNESCO and Sartre, as well as modern works of all genres. In theater, which is of course my field, I think of famous works like Our Town, or even lesser known works like the musical City of Angels, which blurs the lines between musical, film noir, and meta theater. And speaking of film noir and cinema, we can feel six characters influence in works like Vanya on 42nd Street, The Purple Rose of Cairo, being John Malkovich, Adaptation and Atonement. The ghost of six characters even hovers over children's literature, lending an air of gravity and consequence to books and films like Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events and The Neverending Story. Finally, my mind is drawn to genre bending and genre blending meditations that range from comic book, graphic novel, to film, like Grant Morrison's groundbreaking Animal Man, Alan Moore's Watchmen, and most recently, Marvel's hilarious and daring Deadpool. I'd like to conclude with a comparison that may seem a little bit unlikely, but it struck me immediately as being deeply resonant. And this comparison is gonna be drawn between Pirandello's world, which is this bleak seminal existence and another celebrated, I'd argue maybe even more famous and influential work, which was published just five years later in 1926. So both of these works feature characters insisting on the act of their own creation. So let's start with Pirandello. This is a conversation between the theater manager and the character of the father who is trying to get the manager to take up this play and bring the characters to life. And I'm just gonna read the dialogue back and forth. The manager speaks first, the father second. If you can't tell what's going on, I've failed and I'm sorry. I could give you the address of an author if you like. No, 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 look here, you must be the author. I, what are you talking about? Yes, you, you, why not? Because I've never been an author, that's why. Well, then why not turn author now? Everybody does it. You don't want any special qualities. Your task is made much easier by the fact that we're all alive here before you. It won't do. What, then you see us live our drama. Oh, yes, that's all right, but you want someone to write it. No, no, someone to take it down possibly while we play it scene by scene. It will be enough to sketch it out at first and then try it over. Well, I'm almost tempted. It's a bit of an idea. One might have a shot at it. Yes, that's the word. In a sense, that is that the author who created us alive no longer wished or no longer was able materially to put us into a work of art. And this was a real crime, sir because he who has had the good luck to be born a character can laugh even at death. He cannot die. The man, the writer, the instrument of creation will die, but his creation does not die. And to live forever, it does not need extraordinary gifts or to be able to work wonders. Who was Sancho Panza? Who was Don Abondio? Yet they live eternally because they had the fortune to find a fecundating matrix, a fantasy which could raise and nourish them, make them live forever. All right, Pirandello. And now here's the work of another author five years later. Here is Edward Bear coming downstairs now, bump, bump, bump on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs, but sometimes he feels that there really is another way, if only he could stop bumping for a moment and think of it. And then he feels that maybe there isn't. Anyhow, here he is at the bottom and ready to be introduced to you, Winnie the Pooh. When I first heard his name, I said, just as you were going to say, but I thought he was a boy. So did I, said Christopher Robin. Then you can't call him Winnie? I don't. But you said, he's Winnie the Pooh. Don't you know what V means? Uh, yes, now I do, I said quickly. And I hope you do too, because it's all the explanation you're going to get. Sometimes Winnie the Pooh likes a game of some sort when he comes downstairs. And sometimes he likes to sit quietly in front of the fire and listen to a story. 
This evening, what about a story, said Christopher Robin. What about a story, I said. Could you very sweetly tell Winnie the Pooh one? Well, I suppose I could, I said. What sort of stories does he like? About himself, because he's that sort of bear. So hopefully uh, everybody recognized the A.A. A. Milne classic Winnie the Pooh, which had its copyright renewed in 1954 after being published in 1926 and was acquired by none other than the Walt Disney Company in 1966. So while my ears pricked up and my heart beat faster, the moment I heard about six characters, which is one of my genre defining plays, I'm sure that many of you have had different reactions to six characters, up to and including meh. So hopefully this provides a little context. And for those of you who haven't read the play, I hope you do, and I hope you enjoy it. And for those of you who are happy to give early 20th century Italian surrealism a miss and just enjoy its rich influence and legacy. I'll see you at the next Marvel movie. Thank you, Allison. I read that play in theater history class. Thank you, now I get it. <laughs> it only took 30 years. So now let's go to 1922. Here are some highlights from that year. Our national treasure, Betty White, was born, uh, as were Jack Kerouac, funny guy Carl Reiner, Doris Day, and Judy Garland. The Lincoln Memorial was dedicated. Reader's Digest was created. Um, the first successful insulin injection was given. The NFL was created. Morvich won the Kentucky Derby, and the Red Sox, Red Sox did not win the World Series. <laughs> I'm just gonna stick with that one forever. And uh, at the box office, you are watching Robin Hood with Douglas Fairbanks and on the radio, you were listening to April Showers by Al Jolson. So I would like to introduce you to tonight's 1922 presenters. Portia Alawi, uh, hmm, Alayiola, Alayiola, uh, will champion Claude McKay's Harlem Shadows. She is a writer, a performer, an educator, and a curator who uses Afrofuturism and surrealism to examine historical and current issues in black, women, and queer diasporas. Portia is the city of Boston's current poet laureate. She is an individual world poetry slam champion. I highly suggest you go watch some of her videos. And she is the artistic director at Mass Leap, a literary youth organization. And she's also the author of I Shimmer Sometimes Too, available now at a bookstore near you. <laughs> Joseph Nugent will champion James Joyce's Ulysses. He is the professor of practice at Boston College's English department where he devotes a semester to original explorations of Ulysses. His articles have appeared in among other publications, Victorian Studies, The Senses and Society, Air Ireland. His, dev his devotion to Joyce is also reflected in Raiden the Wake, his Finnegan's Wake reading group, and in the Boston Joyce Forum conferences, which he runs annually. So clearly we couldn't find an expert, so we got him. <laughs> <laughs> and Meredith Goldstein will champion Emily Post's etiquette in society, in business, in politics, and at home. She is a reporter, a podcast host, a writer of the long running Boston Globe advice column, Love Letters. She also wrote the novels, Things That Grow, Chemistry Lessons, and The Singles, and as well as the memoir, Can't Help Myself. Lessons and Confessions from a Modern Advice Columnist. Love Letters, the podcast started in 2020 and is now in its sixth season. Um, she was also a member of the Carson and Kennedy family way back when. <laughs> Next, each presenter will make a case for why their book should win the 100 year retroactive book award of 1922. And afterwards, all of you will have an opportunity to ask questions of the panelists and ultimately vote for the winner. So Portia, please take it away. Hi there, good uh, evening, everyone. I'm super excited um, to be here, super elated, um, grateful, honored, um, and humbled, truly, um, as a poet, as a writer. I think Claude McKay was one of the first poets um, that I read and quite often and honestly try to emulate. Um, you know, I don't know that I would be standing before you if it were not. Um, for Claude McKay, um, who is um, 
Jamaican American writer, essayist, novelist, and foundationally a poet, right? Born in Jamaica, uh, passed in Chicago, which is my um, home hometown, and um, published during the Harlem Renaissance, right? So I think of this writer as a writer of the Black diaspora, right? Um, touching all of these spots. And I think that is also evident in Harlem Shadows. Um, I think of Harlem Shadows, this book, as a book of the times, um, as a person who's <laughs> always interested in history and the ghosts of history and how they continuously show up. I found this book almost like an artifact, right? Um, and when I think about this, th this particular time, right, I think about the nadir, right, which uh, a lot of um, African-American scholars consider the lowest point of, in African-American history, right, right after Reconstruction, before the Harlem Renaissance, right? We have the nadir and we have the great migration, which is this upward mobility of Black folks, um, this transition, this change, right, which I think also shows itself in Harlem shadows, right? Um, one of the poems, uh, one of the sonnets is called To One Coming North right, which is really just uh, um, a poem about the snow. It's warning folks that when you get here, there's gonna be snow everywhere. And, and to be frank, the book has quite a few poems about snow. Um, but what I think happens, even though it's about snow, um, it has that title, that subtle title, right, to one coming north. And I think it's absolutely a nod to folks migrating north, right? Um, there's also the race riots, right, occurring in 1919, right, because of the Great Migration, there's all these race tensions um, in the Red Summer, right, and that is very evident in the book as well, when we consider one of his most renowned poems, you know, If We Must Die, right, let it not be in an inglorious spot. Right, so he touches on race riots. Um, a lot of the poems in the book deal with um, the working class, right? A lot of sex workers are <laughs> represented throughout the book in the form of sonnets, right? Um, and then also the Harlem Renaissance, right? This is, this is one of the books um, that was first published early on in the Harlem Renaissance. And again, I think of the Harlem Renaissance as an exercise in joy and in brilliance. And I think that is, again, um, evident in this book. And I think one of the things I enjoyed most as I was like combing through this and deciding what to say is that there, there, <laughs> there are so many poems in this book. There are 74 poems in this book and um, 32 of them are sonnets. 32 are sonnets, um, which I think is really incredible. <laughs> um, if you know anything about the sonnet, right? And um, it's strictness, right? And when I say sonnet, I mean that um, McKay wrote an iambic pentameter for all 32 of those poems, that each one has 14 lines, that there's this rigid and tight rhyme scheme moving through each and every single poem. Um, and I think what I love most about, two things I love about the sonnet. One um, is that it is a love poem right? It is meant traditionally to be a love poem. Um, and I think what people forget is that it's also meant to be, to represent unrequited love, right? And so when I think about the work of the sonnet and the work of Claude McKay happening in this book and the time, right? Um, I think about, you know, those things fitting so well together. I think about the sonnet as a poet political and poetic defiance, right? The first sonnet that appears in the book um, is the English sonnet called America. Although she feeds me bread of bitterness and sinks into my throat her tiger's tooth, stilling my breath of life, I will confess, I love this cultured hell that tests my youth, right? So a lot of these sonnets, I think are very, very political, but I do not um, think that that does not mean they're filled with so much love and holding a dichotomy, if you will. And I think um, the thing I find most fascinating about the sonnet <laughs> is the Volta, right? Is the penultimate couplet at the end. Um, Volta's Italian for the turn, right? So you move through the sonnet and um, you move through these 10 lines and when you get to that last couplet, there is a shift and voice and um, an idea and who's speaking, right? And I think that is why McKay chose to write so many sonnets within this book because we are at a precipice of change during this time, right? It's the Harlem Renaissance. People are migrating north. Um, people are saying this is um, 
not okay. It's not going to happen. And I don't know if folks know this, but Claude McKay also had an extensive background in the labor movement. And so again, that shows up in both during a time period, right? Because at the end of slavery, the, the workforce changes, right? And so there's a huge labor movement and being a part of that, um, he writes about it, right? He does the work, but I think in one sonnet in particular, the Harlem dancer, he talks about um, a sex worker um, and paints the scene of her dancing. And again, then in that Volta, he puts himself in that position, right? He says, but looking at her falsely smiling face, I knew herself was not in that strange place, right? That's the only eye that appears in the poem is in that last, <laughs> that last line of the poem, right? I think he does the Volta, he exercises the Volta again um, in a sonnet called The Lynching, right? Where he moves through the poem um, talking about painting the image of a lynching, which is pretty harsh. It doesn't sound like a love poem, right? He opens up, um, with the image of the spirit leaving the body and ascending to heaven. And as he's talking about that, he's also talking about what's happening, right? And then we get to the penultimate couplet where he zooms in on children at the lynching, right? There are young people at the lynching and he kind of leaves us with that idea, right? But look, at, excuse me, um, and little lads, lynchers that were to be, danced around the dreadful thing in fiendish glee. Right, he leaves us with this image that if we are, if we're, if we're lynching, what does that mean for the children who are watching and who are dancing and celebrating this? And this is the future that we will stay in. And then um, I probably close talking about <laughs> uh, one of again one of the reasons I write, one of the poems I recited as a young poet, poet and person. Um, if we must die, right, um, where he talks about again, these race riots, um, again, being attacked as a black person, right? But in that last line, that last couplet, those last two lines, he says, like men will face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back, right? And I think for me, that is what makes this book um, uh, brilliant, brilliant and, and, and a ma ma marker of time, um, a relic of the time, um, a time of change, right? A time of a constant turn of refusing to, to be beaten down, right? Um, I think he does that through all of the themes of the book, but I think more, more importantly and mo more effortlessly, it shows itself in the sonnet um, and his use of the sonnet form, I think, is really what <laughs> uh, makes him one of my favorite writers. So I'm sure it went over time. Thank you so much. Vote for Harlem Shadows. Bravo. Joseph, you're up. Take it away. My microphone. But I think you can probably still hear me. Um, thanks very much for having me here. Um, James Joyce's Ulysses was seven years in the writing. Its 18 chapters were written mostly in English with 25 other languages sprinkled about. 245 individual characters, including William Shakespeare, Alfred Lord Tennyson, King Edward VII, Elijah, the Papal Nuncio, an entire singing choir, a talking horse, and a speaking bar of soap, <laughs> populated 700 pages. It has more idioms, neologisms, and colloquialisms than you can count. It culminates in one single sentence containing 4,930 words. And to convince you of its greatness, the associates of the Boston Public Library have given me five minutes. <laughs> I could quote eminent critics, great minds. T.S. Eliot held this book to be the most important expression which the present age has found. Vladimir Nabokov adored it as a divine work of art. And Ernest Hemingway declared it a most goddamn wonderful book. It's my bad American accent. Nearer to home, yet 100 years and still 3,000 miles distance from my students uh, last semester. For Ernesto, it was awesome. For John, it was bad. It was sick. Both of those are terms of approval. <laughs> for Claudia, it was a blast. For Antonio, it was mind-blowing. And for Claire, a freshman having a very hard time of it, as so many of us were last year. She says that book she wrote it was my savior. But there are many skeptics, and there still are plenty of them out there. Virginia Woolf thought it an illiterate, underbred book. 
to hit your arms up hard as the dirtiest, most indecent, obscene thing ever written. He didn't evidently read his own books. They burnt it in Paris. They set fire to it in New York. They persecuted it in Spain, proscribed it in Germany. They banned it in the Soviet Union. And perhaps that's enough to win accolades because any book that can get up the nose of both Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin must have some merit in it. They're still fulminating. You'll find them, disappointed purchasers, brandishing one star in the Amazon reviews. Ulysses, the shriek is too complicated, challenging, demanding, troubling, puzzling, and quite often plaintively, not what I had expected. Just like life, too complicated, challenging, demanding, troubling, puzzling, and not always as we had expected. So yes, I admit it may be the most overbought and underread book ever written. <laughs> it's possible that more bookshelves have been adorned by it than minds have been illuminated by it. And here's another concession that perhaps it's not for everybody. So it may be instructive to look at those who can't finish it. Perhaps stupid people can't. And I, I, I don't mean, of course, not IQ stupid. That means nothing. I use the word in the Irish sense. Um, it's that kind of willed stupidity, that refusal of new knowledges, that closing off of the mind. There's a technical term in Ireland for its gobshite. Ideologically blinkered people likely won't finish it. Totalitarians will soon slam shut its covers. It's seldom loved by the right. It's unlikely to appear in the bookshelf of all of the previous presidents, American presidents. The prudish, the prissy, the prim, the sexually repressed may have difficulties completing it. Obscenity was the charge in the courts of America, of England, of Spain, and in the court of James Joyce's own family. My mother, his niece, told Joyce, says that your book is too dirty to read. <laughs> Tell your mammy, he replied, that if my book is too dirty to read, life is too dirty to live. Who else won't finish it? Yes, the narrow-minded and the unadventurous, but above all, the common condition that I've recognized in my experience in teaching this book is that people without curiosity would have great difficulty getting to the end of this book. Because this great book is treasured by the inquisitive, by the inquiring, by the curious, by the eager, by the searching. It's trumpeted by those who from childhood have wanted to know what's underneath that stone, who's on the other side of that wall, What's going on behind that keyhole? What's to be found on the next page? It's adored by those brave enough to cast aside their own presumptions, the expectations that have been instilled into them about plot, character, and resolution, and those often pre-conscious expectations about the way language should work and what a proper author should be doing. Ulysses, then, is a text for people prepared to be their own Odysseus, their own Leopold Bloom, people resolved to set off on their own long, demanding, troubling, puzzling, maybe even heroic voice, a voyage across its pages throughout perhaps their own long, if they're lucky, puzzling, troubling, difficult, hard to know life. For them, those determined ones, the reading offers very great rewards. They'll read it for the incomparable, incomparable insight into the human condition provided by Leopold Bloom, the most completely realized character in fiction brought to life by James Joyce, an artist of supreme genius, his antennae attuned like no other to the signals of the zeitgeist. They'll read it and love it because more than any other work I know, Ulysses helps us notice as hours, days, weeks, whole years of our lives seem to slide by on Mark. Joyce, like nobody else, wraps his knuckles on the table and reminds us to take notice, to trust our senses, to treasure the moment. They'll read it because, and I'm an old fashioned humanist, because reading is good for you. It builds empathy. It makes you a better person. And Joyce makes us all better persons. Read it. I tell my students for solace in their old age, that far distant horizon in their minds. You'll come back, I say, to Bloom and to Stephen and to Molly, old friends, when other friends have left. 
And yes, read it for street cred, <laughs> read it for bragging rights, right? Join that elite who can modestly boast that they've not just begun, but completed the greatest novel of the 20th century. And finally, read it as a proclamation, as a statement of who you are and how you feel about the world. Read it to poke once more Hitler and Stalin <laughs> and their modern equivalents in the eye. Thanks very much. All right, you convinced me. I want street cred. I'm going to read it. <laughs> Meredith. Okay, can everybody hear me? So despite my day job as an advice columnist, I'm not a fan of self-help, rules or etiquette. I believe most questions are quite nuanced and never have one all incumbents all encompassing answer, and very rarely is there one way to do something right. I am particularly repelled by etiquette outlined by someone who believes that wealth defines character, that gender influences how one is to behave, and that traditions are universal, or that folding a nap napkin correctly is more important than empathy. To be very clear, reading a list of rules for appropriate human behavior makes me want to curl up into a ball, especially right now, as I had to have to retrain how to dress myself to present myself in public. Um, it only occurred to me that I probably haven't turned the ringer off of my phone as I got to the podium. <laughs> but this is precisely why Emily Post's Bible of Rules is so important to me and to all of us. It is this book that provides a snapshot of who we're told to be versus who we should be. It explains to some extent who we're up against versus, uh, and helps us redefine society, which is actually a collective far larger than the intended audience of the book and probably much larger than an audience that had access to a book like this. Emily Post was born to an architect who made very fancy housing. She's also the daughter of a coal baron. This woman could afford to write. She could also afford to get divorced. She afforded plenty without losing her place in the upper echelons of her community. This person, who is known for telling the world what's appropriate, had every privilege in the world, making her perhaps the worst arbiter of what is right. But we can learn some things very genuinely from her rules. Arriving late to see a friend is, in fact, not very nice. Avoid it when possible. Post also has a point or two about the rules of written emotion that I think are incredibly relevant today. And in later editions of her book, authored by her grandchildren, they address this. You know, we're never supposed to assume that our tone will be understood in writing. Words of a passing moment are meant to stand forever, she writes. Something you might think is funny might come off as cruel when written down, and that's so true. I wonder what she would think of texting Emily Post, I know, in the dating world, would not stand for ghosting. <laughs> Another fair suggestion, don't wear strong perfume on a train. Someone, me most likely, will probably be allergic to it. Also, don't be the person who wears your mask under your nose or on your neck. What are you even wearing it for? There is humanity in this book. Uh, there is an attempt to be inclusive. But then much of it, the rules of it all, is a guide to dismissing those who aren't in a certain tier of people, all of whom joined that tier of people by inheriting money, opportunity, and a certain look. Her rules are meant to show who doesn't belong in many cases and to limit expression, self-expression, and anyone who isn't already on top. So we read this book to make sure we're not falling for it now. How do we exclude someone from conversation, from a room, because they can't perhaps afford to be there? How often we do we decide someone is classless because they don't follow the more modern version of post language and privilege? What coded words do we use to separate ourselves from others? When I read this book in 2022, I catch myself. I catch myself in assumptions about gender and who does what and why it matters. I laugh when I read a lady is never allowed to ask a man to dance because of course we will and we do. But do we remember this? Do we know what rules benefit whom? 
I read etiquette and I commit to making sure there is room and space for people who might not be exactly like me or might not have been invited to the table to speak their mind. I am reminded by this book to bring people along who don't have a door open to them. When people ask about the importance of advice columns, what I do every day and get paid to do, I'm often told, oh, that's a job. And I tell them they're not frivolous, particularly advice columns. They're actually incredible snapshots of where we are as a people at any given time. We see that problems, some problems are very timeless and we understand why a breakup always hurts. Similarly, when we read etiquette, we learn who, might, who we might be now, what rules have remained for literally no good reason, and who we want to become as a society. And I mean society with a lowercase s. Emily Post gave us a guide that admits how many hoops a person has to jump through to be valued and seen. She gives us an outline that 100 years later we can use to determine exactly what to reject and what traditions based on humanity are worth keeping. So for all of its ups and downs, I submit to you that a rule book of how to be a person in the world can teach us plenty. Fantastic. All right, you guys, how about a round of applause for all of our presenters? So now on to the debate, why we're all here today. What is the best book of 1922? For those of you who have questions in the audience, we have microphones down at the front of the aisle here. Um, if you don't want to descend the stairs, wave your hand, we'll bring one to you. Um, and uh, for those in the virtual world, please use the Q&A button for your questions to be read for everyone to hear. So while we take questions, you can vote at any time using the QR code and the instructions in your programs or on the poll in the Zoom session for our virtual friends. And if you're having difficulty using the QR code, raise your hand, someone will cover to you. No judgment, I can't make them work either. It's all right. So who's got questions? I have a question for Portia. Um, the, the poet you uh, introduced us to is somebody about whom I don't know. And the title, can you say the title again? Is it Harlem, Sh Harlem Shadows? It is. Can you talk about its influence or another way to say it is the Harlem light? That is to say, where does it stand in what followed? How influential um, has McKay been? Yeah. Um... You know, I don't know um, the answer to that on a global scale, if you will. I know it more personal, personally, if that feels okay. Um, I will say that this particular book um, comes with a four from Jericho Brown, um, who I'm not sure if folks are familiar with, but won the Pulitzer Prize in poetry um, for um, the creation of a, a new form. Um, the duplex, right? And in his four, Jericho Brown talks about the fact that um, McKay was a Black queer writer, right? Um, and that if McKay hadn't written, um, neither would Jericho Brown, right? Um, and I think the same is true for me. I don't know if, you know, I can't talk about everybody's influence, but I know as a, as a young person, as a little girl, I was always the person who um, recited a poem during Black History Month assembly. And, you know, I would get water and people would come up to me and they would recite the poem back to me that I had just, re you know, recited. Um, and more specifically, right, when I first moved to Boston, um, I had decided I was a poet <laughs> and that I would be writing. And I took a workshop here um, with the poet laureate at the time, Sam Cornish, um, who was offering these free workshops. And I brought in this poem and um, Sam Cornish pulled me outside of the workshop and he said, um, I don't mean to be invasive, but this sounds just like Claude McKay. And, you know, um, I never came back to the workshop, <laughs> embarrassed to say, but I think that, I don't know, that is something that I'm continuously and constantly holding with me. The fact that, you know, I can exercise um, my own political beliefs um, as radical as they are, right? And also be within alignment and tradition of something as prestigious um, as the sonnet, right? And what does that look like constantly? So I don't know, that's probably the influence, I think for me, but also for poets in general, is this um, welcomed um, confrontation with um, the literary canon. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. 
Um, Meredith, I guess I have a question for you about the book. And it's true that, I mean, an etiquette guide sounds so dated in 2022, but maybe it's from you. I've, I've certainly read your column for years. And, um, but I always felt like the most important message of advice and an etiquette book was that the rules don't matter as much as the empathy for the other person. And that if you're paying any attention to what etiquette means is you're trying to get along with someone else. And you're trying to learn, to learn a way to make it work. And so I always felt like that empathy was the important thing. I mean, do you wanna talk about that at all? Um, I mean, it's, it's a very difficult thing with, and one of the reasons I think it's so important, Emily's post book, because you're right, at its heart, it is how can we show someone else our good intentions and hear them and be present with them. Um, but of course, once you get into the, here's how to plan a wedding and the only one way to do it correctly, or here's how to introduce a person based on the wealth they've, they've amassed, it becomes harder to, to take. Uh, but I think the best of, of etiquette is about show learning the best method to show your good intention and of course if we were to write a guide right now you know i always joke i'm gen x but my millennial friends if i call them they're like what happened they assume my calling them is an emergency a text is is normal right so i actually think about well what will it mean from that for them if they see a missed call um you know will it scare them and uh these are and, and, and this is why the snapshot of it is also so important for the year right which is it is a changing time and emily post is attempting to say here's how you can do it right right now and there are many editions of this book and of course her her descendants would revisit it later and again it, it is why I think it's so important so I do think that it it, it can be both um, it is both a beautiful attempt at giving everyone a language for kindness but there are some people who are not included in the conversation at all and when you think about the accessibility to these rules to understand them um, that's where it gets tricky. So I, you know, I think that it is important because it is all of the above. At its best, it is teaching us how to relate. At its worst, it's forgetting who belongs in the everyone. Thank you for your electrifying presentation. It was wonderful. Could you read us one of your favorite sonnets that's such a beautiful form? Ah, uh, sure, yeah. I, there, that's hard because there are so many um, that blew me away. I think I'll um, read maybe possibly the most famous if I can find it. I want to say it's on 54. Let's see. It's not. All right, 52. Um, if we must die, if we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and pinned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave. And for their thousand blows, deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men, we'll face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. Wanted to get that off my chest, thank you. <laughs> question uh, for Joe. So I'm a big music nut. And um, I don't know if this is an appropriate uh, analogy, but when S Stravinsky um, wrote, you know, th the Rite of Spring, there were riots in Paris, and it seemed like it came out of nowhere. And um, I wonder if you could make the same parallel with Ulysses. I mean, did his earlier work suggest that this monumental and unique book um, would emerge? 
it certainly, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm not too sure if, I, if my microphone is hearing as soon as I managed to pull it off, it is. Indeed, it certainly offended many. And we heard Virginia Woolf there and, 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 and uh, Lawrence and very many others. Um, people were offended by it, maybe not as much as they were later on by Finnegan's Wake, which threw an awful lot of people out. Um, but it was, it was high modernism. The whole point of the thing was it, was it was breaking the rules. Everything about modernism was new. Everything about Joyce was new. Everything in this book was, was setting out quite simply to show that the old times were over. We were no longer in the 19th century. The proprieties and the correctnesses, and indeed some of the things indeed, that were probably within the books of etiquette were gone. They were of the past. And Joyce did it as, 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 as flagrantly, as determinedly, as energetically as, as anybody could possibly do. There were no riots in the streets about <laughs> Joyce, um, but there were, there were a lot of disgruntled people around. There were a lot of uh, writers who were not very pleased about the kind of thing that he was doing. But then so many others saw the value on it and saw that this was a voice unlike any other voice that had gone before, a man really of genius who was going to set the, 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 the headlines for the way of writing would be in the future. One particular point that I, I, I think of, I, I mentioned the students who uh, in, in my class, I'm astounded and delighted every time to discover that a book which back in 1922 confounded so many others, great, great readers, people like George Bernard Shaw were unable to make sense of it, um, it just cut and finish it. Um, that nowadays that I can take a 20 year old in America and they can come to terms with it. What's the explanation? It's not because they're any more intelligent than, than people were then. But Joyce was so prescient that he reshaped writing in such a way that even 20 year olds coming into my class have got an understanding, a feel for how different the world is, how different writing can be. And that answers your question. Do we have any questions for our virtual friends? We do. We have a question. Um, I'm going to direct this to Allison. If you think that uh, Six Characters was an excellent example of something influenced by its time in 1921 versus an excellent example of an influencer of 1921. Ooh, that's a good question, unseen friend. Um, so let me see if I've got this. It is Six Characters more influenced by its time or influencing what is to come? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> well done. Uh, well Iles, thank you. Thank Way you to keep us much. on time. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> good night, everyone. No, uh, <laughs> no I, I think I do think the answer is yes, but I think that it's far more the latter, which is to say influencing what's to come than it was the former. Um, and I can't remember the exact words. I was reading uh, the foreword to the Gutenberg edition of uh, six characters and uh, the translator had bothered to transcribe some of the things that the Italians had shouted uh, when the play was first performed. And apparently someone shouted, what does it mean? <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, and I, I lived in Italy for a time and, and the, the phrase, which I promise you, you can tell your children, is a makifai, which is like, what are you doing? And it's what you say when like somebody cuts you off on the highway, you know? So I think that's kind of how Pirandello's play hit a lot of people. It's not to say that meta theater, which is, you know, our, our dressed up way of saying a play about a play, a play within a play. It's not like those things didn't exist, right? It's not like meta fiction didn't exist. You know, I was combing through my mental Rolodex trying to come up with novels that I thought Pirandello had influenced. And I was like, oh, what about Tristram Shandy? And I was like, wrong century, much too early. <laughs> Those of you who know your Tristram Shandy, it wildly predates Pirandello. So it's not like this is totally new. But when we look at theatrical modernism and the journey from sort of like what you might call modernism to postmodernism or theatrical surrealism or however you want to define this interstitial period of genres, I think for a long time, theater was considered to be an accurate reflection of what was going on in real life. People came to the theater to see the world they knew interpreted for them in a very real lived way. And when you look at playwrights like Chekhov and Ibsen and the great plays of the 19th century, that's very much what's going on. And Pirandello is saying, I'm gonna write a play about people who didn't even get to have a play be about them. And so they're mad. And that was groundbreaking and, and shocking 
to the people who came to see the theater, especially those who were used to hearing real life stories, true seeming stories. And I think it marks this really big division between what I might call the perceived responsibility of theater and the perceived responsibility of cinema. And I think you see the same thing in art, right? That originally art is intended to represent as closely as possible lived experience or actual reality. And in the early 20th century is where we begin to see abstract expressionism. We're following on the heels of impressionism. We're creating something that's so dynamic, so new because it is no longer incumbent on those arts to be mirrors of our world. They can be prisms of our world. And I think that's, uh, that's how in the end I would answer that question is that I think of Pirandello's play as a prism. Like there's certainly there's a ray of light that enters it, but there's a rainbow that exits. And that's the influence and, and what we see in the evolving nature of art in the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Or yes, whichever. Or yes. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> One more question from our virtual friends. We do. Um, so this is per, for Professor Nugent. Um, could you speak to the modernity of Molly? It seems to me Molly has done more for feminism than most. Ooh, yeah, indeed. Um, the book, of course, ends with that assertion of that yes, yes, yes by Molly. They might be three words about which there's been more ink and perhaps even blood spilt uh, among Joycians of various sorts than any other three words. Um, I, I do find it in my classes too, uh, young women who are, can be very, very offended by this book um, throughout. It does seem that Joyce has little time for women until they get to that final chapter, which seems to be an explosion of, 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 of womanness as best Joyce could possibly do it, that recuperates all of the little insults and the assaults that have been made actually to women and womankind throughout, throughout the book. Um, my argument with people who, who are offended by this, as they quite rightly are, is that Joyce, Joyce must be read in his intentions. And he's putting these kinds of insults to women in the mouths of the people of Dublin at the time because he disapproved of them there. So he's been realistic in his, in, his, in his retelling of what it was. But the fact that he turns around at the end and gives us this magnificent woman, this woman so freed from all the inhibitions and the, 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 the containments and all of the things that, that had reduced women to the state that they were in, in the Dublin of 1904, that he knew it, and indeed in 1922 when he was publishing this book, seems to be Joyce's proclamation that we're in a new era for women and that Molly Bloom should be the woman who can I think, carry the flag for women in a way that nobody else could have done before. Um, I'm not too sure if that helps. So that makes her, I think, a very modern woman for, for, for today in the way that even Leopold Bloom, of course, is a very modern man. Her new type of femininity is a wonderful echo of Leopold Bloom's new type of masculinity. He's a man who stands up throughout against the, 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 the cold, um, heavy, uh, uh, almost violent masculinity uh, that's, that's depicted by the other people of Dublin. And the one special argument when it's put to him about war, will he not stand up like a man? And he tells us that, of course, what he stands for is the opposite of hatred, the opposite of war. And that is, he said, is love. So Molly, I think, is the modern woman of love, as Leopold Bloom, I like to think, is the modern man of, of, of love for, uh, for men in the future. We good? Do we have a winner? Have you guys voted? Well, let's get to it. <laughs> so uh, again, you can use the QR code um, that's on your program. We would love for you to vote. And I'll just vamp now. <laughs> Unless you guys have more questions, in which case we can do that too. But I just want to thank all of you, Allison, Portia, Joseph, and Meredith. Such a wonderful discussion this evening, really. I've learned so much. We'll just take a little pause while you all vote. You can sing a song if you'd like, tell a joke. <laughs> tap, Allison, give us a little tap number, no? Hi, did you wanna ask a question? Well, I just want to say how gratifying it is to get a portrait of the year, 100 years ago, by listening to three books discussed from, from such very different points of origin in different parts of the world, from different experiences, and to know that the concerns of all those books continue uh, to be important to us today. Um, it, it gives us a, a, a kind of lance-like keyhole look at where we've come from. I guess Peter was saying that in the beginning, but I'm just borrowing his thoughts. Uh, but it really is gratifying. I want, I want to thank you all.
for what you've given us. Okay. But usually when people do this to me, I know what I'm talking about. No idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, are we here? <gasps> you guys, I have the envelope. So shout out, who do you think is going to win? Shout out, I'm kidding. All right, so <laughs> for the 100 year retroactive book award of 1922, voted on by all of you in here and all of our virtual friends out there. James Joyce's Ulysses, presented by Joseph. <laughs> James. He's the one. I feel like he wrote the book. I feel like you had the accent, and you just had one up on everyone else. With that. <laughs> if I had to, if I had to guess, but. I do want to say that I think a lot of people, see myself and I write, is particularly focused on romance. But um, I think about what I advise people to swipe, swipe right or left on based on a person's favorite book, and. Whereas I might have said, oh, well, if, if their favorite book is Ulysses, you might want to go left on that. <laughs> you have actually, or like, you know, sometimes if it's infinite jest, like, I'm like, okay, we get it. You, you finished it. And, but, but you may, you may have won me over to considering the advising as well. See, right? we all want the street cred now. We all want the street cred. <laughs> Our, our panelists really it was wonderful peter did you want to say something before we go let me get out of your way mr joseph you won a prize oh really, well, really? <laughs> hi, hi. I'm sure james joyce won a prize really. thank you so much that's terrible well, I'd like to thank our participants too. Wow, uh, this was such a wonderful evening, so powerful. Um, Kennedy, what a wonderful moderator you've been, and all of our presenters. Uh, I've learned, Gregory, thank you so much. I've learned a tremendous amount tonight, and it's been just a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Um, I have the floor, so I would like to take the opportunity to plug two events that we have coming up, the Associates of the BPL. Uh, one is Literary Spotlights, uh, which will be a virtual conversation uh, between our own uh, Christy Cashman and the Pulitzer Prize winning author, Geraldine Brooks. And that's gonna take place uh, towards the end of March. We, we're working on the date, so stay tuned. We'll have that for you. And the other plug is for Literary Lights, which is our big uh, gala. And that is going to be April 10th, April 10th. And that's gonna be um, a very special. Our keynote is uh, Henry Louis Gates. So um, please um, check that out. It's gonna be a great evening. A couple of more thank yous. I've got my wife in the audience. So as I get older, I need to thank her every single chance I have. Thank you, Susan, and my daughter, Elizabeth. <laughs> Oh, and um, we just have a wonderful staff at the Associates, and I want to thank our uh, three staff people who are here. Louisa, who's our executive director. I don't know where you are, Louisa. Uh, Laura, who's our development director. And Kathleen, whose last day with us is tomorrow. We will miss you, but she's going on to uh, run events at Milton Academy, and we wish you every happiness and success there, Kathleen. All the best. Um, so uh, we can chit chat for a little while, but the library does close its doors at eight o'clock. So that's unfortunately, a, um, you know, an end. And there, I think there's an alarm that goes off at uh, 745. <laughs> so don't be alarmed. It's supposed to go off. So anyhow, again, thank you, participants. Good night, everyone.